Hello friends, welcome to our detailed walkthrough of lovely lady Helen. I know we did just a real quick run through for you right before we bought her, uh, but you got no history, you got no detail of the house, you got no look into what makes Helen special. So today we're gonna take you inside, walk you through and let you see what really makes this lady incredible. I'm gonna go ahead and go inside before I tell you a lot of the history of the house, which is very important and part of this tour, but we're afraid we're gonna get some traffic noise out here. So let's go in this beautiful front door and learn a little more about our lady. We have some helpers today too. Excuse me, gentlemen. So here we are in the front hallway of Helen. She is an 1858 roof revival. She was built as a spec home by a local man who had come into town. He had come in from Utah. He was a member of the uh, LDS church, but the very, very, uh, we're gonna say super conventional variety of the church and had some sister wives and the townspeople did not like that. And so they ran him out of town. So this house and all of his other properties in town were left sort of half finished, partially built and townspeople were able to buy those properties unfinished and finish them to their taste. So what we have here is a property that was built as a spec home. And then in 1858, J.C. Tappan purchased the house. Uh, we actually know from the from the roof lines that we found in the attic that the portico was not part of the original structure. So when J.C. Tappan bought it and finished it, he did add the portico. We have another very traditional 4 over 4 Greek revival with their double portico um, and all of that 1858 transitioning into Italian age purple design on the exterior. This front hall poses some really interesting mysteries for us. So let me show you a few of the things that we're learning about it that we really think are fascinating. Um, I can't wait to figure out. One of the things that I noticed when we first came in was that the front hall is scored with an ashlar block design. Now, what is ashlar block? Ashlar block is actually a form of stone that is quarried in England and was used in a stacked stone construction on many of the great manor houses in England. Obviously, here in the United States, we don't do stone construction very often, but having a stacked stone house was still considered a sign of great wealth. So on both the interior and exterior of properties during this Greek Revival period, which many of these the homes in the United States in the Greek Revival style are patterned after those great manor homes in England, because of course, that's where the Greek Revival trend started, they mimicked the ashlar block design by putting up plaster or stucco, so it's on the outside of stucco, so it's just the plaster, and then scoring it to look like ashlar block, like the stacked stone ashlar block. We've been doing some experiments with paint removal. Obviously, this overcolor is not the original. Um, so these are some experiments we've been doing with different paint removal techniques. This one appears to be uh, the best paint removal technique, and you can see in here the original texturing that was given to the plaster to make it mimic the appearance of cut stone along with the scoring. And look how much deeper that scoring is once we get 200 years worth of paint coating cut out of it. The reason for the center hall design was very, very practical. This is of course at a time before central air and we're in the south, so it gets hotter than Hades here in late summer. So this was natural ventilation. You would open your front door, your back door, the cross breeze would run through, it would circulate through the four rooms downstairs and be drawn up through what functions basically as a chimney for this large open stairwell. But we have another mystery here in Miss Helen in this front hall that we still can't figure out. So let me show you. We have to dig into it. So normally this back entry, because of the Greek Revival style of, and what was in fashion, would have perfectly mirrored the front entry. They would have been mirrored openings. So you would have your door, your side lights, which we have, but then as you notice, we have a transom over our front entry. And we don't have a transom here, which seems, it's, that's just completely wrong. There should absolutely be a tra transom here. Not until you come out here. Onto what would have been the open back porch breezeway to the original kitchen, and you see that we, do have a transom here. At some point, there have been some major structural changes that we still haven't unraveled yet, we will, that covered up the transom. So either this was done when the home was built or calculation, because the stairwell is completely appropriate to the age of the home. The shape of the stairway is as it should be for 1858. 
So this doesn't look like a replacement stair. So this configuration here with the loss of that transom, very strange. We don't know what's going on. Something else really fun to look at with the stair well design. You'll notice that these spindles and the spindles at the top facing the front door are different. These squared spindles that you see here, these are the appropriate style for 1858. Those are the spindles that would have been on the entire staircase in 1858. But let's talk about why they're different here and some more of the history of this house. So J.C. Tappan was an officer in the Confederate Army during the Civil War. So he and his family left this house during the Civil War. Usually the family members would refugee to other states or areas that were safer while the men were off at war. But it looks like for some research that we're doing that Mrs. Tappan actually went with her husband to battle um, and followed and stayed with him during the Civil War. When the Union forces came in and occupied Helena, the Battle of Helena is a huge battle in Civil War history. If any of you are Civil War buffs, you've heard of the Battle of Helena. Helena is a very important city on the Mississippi River, both to attack and take Little Rock, the capital of Arkansas, which was a Confederate state, and then to hold Vicksburg, which is slightly downriver, also on the Mississippi. Helena was crucial. So Union forces came in here and they took Helena. The officers, uh, led by a Colonel Bussey, garrisoned inside this home. We have historic photos of where you can see Helen, where you can see the house, and all around her are encampments of Union soldiers. And we know that the, the officers garrisoned here. We also know that William Tecumseh Sherman, on his march to the sea, came through Helena, Arkansas, and stayed in this house for a period of time. So William Tecumseh Sherman, the man who won the Civil War for the North, stayed in this house and made battle plans for taking Little Rock from this location. But what we also know is that when the Tappans came home to their property after the Civil War, they came home and found the house completely decimated by the Northern troops who had been here. We have written accounts by uh, a young officer who was garrisoned in the house that said it was a very fine house, but the officers who came in and out took away with them anything that you could carry. So that means anything. They took furniture, they took uh, any wood to burn for campfires. They took doors, they took mantles, they stripped the house clean. So we know that these spindles, because we have a few remnants in the attic, were actually replacement spindles that were put in after the Tappans returned home when they ended up doing a massive remodel in the late 1860s. So what you see in the house now and the style of the home is much more 18, late 1860s than it is 1858. They took an 1858 home and restyled her and gave her a facelift in the late 1860s. So let's go into the front formal parlor. We're going to try to do this restoration and preservation differently than we've ever done another one in the past. Usually we take on the entire project at one time. This home is in such livable condition, we can actually move into it right now. It has a lot of structural issues that we have to deal with and a lot of cosmetic issues, but the beauty of this project is that we can deal with it a piece at a time. So we're going to try to do one room at a time in this property and get each room completed before we move to the next room. And we feel like that'll keep it from feeling too overwhelming. It feels pretty overwhelming right now, but we're going to try to do one room at a time. But this room has some amazing features. Uh, the first, of course, we discovered underneath the, underneath three layers of wallpaper is the original wallpaper by Burge out of Buffalo, New York. It's a great key design. There's gold leaf running. Um, this is also an, also an arsenic green wallpaper. So this kind of Christmas tree green was created by wall, uh, wallpaper factories used arsenic to create this color. So this is in fact would have been a toxic wallpaper at the time that it was installed. We know it's here. We thought it was in the dining room because it's in, it's in a cupboard in the dining room, but I've done some wallpaper removal in there and it doesn't appear to be in there. So I don't know what has happened. We'll learn more as we go. All the mantles are from the late 1860s and they are cast iron. You can see that we are doing some paint stripping experiments on this side as well, trying to see which is giving us the best result with stripping. I think this one is gonna make me happy. We have all the original casings, baseboards and door surrounds. This woodwork has always been painted. Um, I know we're gonna get some comments. I can't wait to see that we were stripped. I can't wait to see it stained. 
research shows us from scraping and analysis that this has this woodwork has always been painted, which again, very common of the Greek Revival period of this home. So 1858, the trend was paint your wood. It was a sign of wealth. Either paint it with a solid color or paint it with a faux bois or faux mauve finish so that it looks like something else. But it probably, we know it was never stained. It was, that would have not been de rigueur when it was built. We have our original plaster cornices all the way around the room. There's a little bit of moss, but very manageable. That will all be stripped of its 42 coats of paint. Um, we do know that the walls and ceilings in some of the room have drywall added to them, and we'll be taking that down. We've lost a lot of the profile of the moldings because of the drywall, so that will be removed and we'll go back to plaster. Hey, buddy, I have a friend who's going to help with the tour. This mirror uh, was a possession of Miss Catra Hooker, who was the last member of the Hooker family to live here in the house. And you'll see that the top also has the Greek key design, which was mimicked in the original wallpaper. So I, I need to get some more history on the piece to find out just how long, in fact, it has been here. But we do know that it was the possession of Miss Catherine Polo, lovingly known as Cappy to her family and friends. But the showpiece of this entire house, the thing that makes this whole house, not that the house itself is in brand new nothing back doors and that's worth saving on its own, but these double doors entering into the dining room are just magnificent. They are etched in frosted glass, depicting a biblical story of Ruth and Naomi. They open up to the dining room, which very much mimics the living room in size and style. You have a matching fireplace mantle. We do know that the mirror, the, the doors themselves, not just this etched glass, but the entire idea of having doors somewhere in these two rooms came in 1858. We know from written accounts that before that time, these two rooms were open to each other. So that, as the account says, when you walk in the front door, you can see the mantel pieces of both the living room and the dining room from the front door entryway. Another beautiful space with its original plaster cornices. And as it always would have, it exits onto the back porch, which of course would have been open, with access to the original 1858 brick kitchen that we have in the back. We'll, we'll look at that another day. Um, I do want to point out this is the original wallpaper intact. You can see it inside of this cupboard. Still beautiful and vibrant. I hate it can't be salvaged. There's just, there was so much water damage to some parts of the house that even if we had carefully, carefully, carefully stripped back the layers of wallpaper on top of it, I, I think we would have had too much loss to maintain it. Uh, let's go ahead and do the other two parlors and then we'll do the back porch. And then this is what would have been a study, a music room, or a library space. But for the last, gosh, probably 30 years, Ms. Catherine Pillow used this as her master bedroom. Once she didn't want to navigate the stairs anymore, she came down here, um, and she lived to be 94 years old. So she got, she spent many decades in this room. This was her bed, and we were able to buy this bed from the family, along with the mirror that you saw in the living room. Uh, this bed, the reason I wanted this bed is because it came from another home here in Helena. So this bed has lived its entire life of close to 200 years here in the city of Helena, and it is in such beautiful, magnificent condition. Um, like it could be brand new, but we know it's not. And then this is the family parlor. This is one of the parlors where the drywall has been added, so really we don't know a lot about what the moldings would have been in here. They're not the high style plaster right now, but we don't know if they would have been. We've lost a lot of definition and detail in the, uh, the casings and around the baseboards. All the doors do have these wonderful porcelain doorknobs. They're on every single one, but those again would have been an 1858 edition. We have another cast iron mantle. We need to the two bottom parlors, and Gussie's getting in. <laughs> so now let's go and take a look at where our kitchen is today. So we've gotten several questions about whether or not we're going to open up this back porch. Lots of votes for open up the back porch. The problem with that is. This back porch affords us the best opportunity for a modern kitchen and a modern uh, utility space without having to alter the character of the original home. 
We want this to be as close to a true restoration as we can get. It will be preservation in that we will keep bathrooms inside. True, true restoration, we would take out those bathrooms and take it all the way back to 1858. That this will be more of a preservation that allows each of those uh, decades in the life of this house to be seen. But if we keep this as an enclosed, heated, and cooled space, we can maintain our kitchen. We'll be taking out the lowers and getting the lowers in. We'll be reconfiguring the uppers, but we will be keeping the leaded glass. The leaded glass was acquired from a local church when it was remodeled and was used in the doors here in the kitchen. So we will be keeping those and just adding on some uppers and doing some reconfiguration. It's not a huge kitchen, but it's fully functional. So, you know, the idea that we need these massive kitchens in our home is a completely modern idea. Like I said, kitchens used to be entirely detached. There's no reason that to take up a whole entire room of this house for a kitchen space when this will function just fine for this entire space, even though it's going to be bed and breakfast. And then we use this end as a utility space. So it's a great mudroom utility space. And you have all the original gorgeous cladding exposed in here and a glorious view out the backyard, which in the spring, the yard is a absolute garden because Miss uh, Pillow was an avid gardener. And we'll be bringing those back to their glory. And you see the 1858 kitchen, which is, I would have bought the house for the 1858 kitchen alone. Here we are in the upstairs central hall. As you can see, the formal plaster cornices extend to the second floor, which is very rare in a house of this period. Usually, formal finishes like this would have been saved exclusively for public areas. And obviously, this is not a public area. This is a private area. So the fact that we have this beautiful plaster work on the second floor as well is really telling about um, how the original family felt about their private spaces. They wanted their private spaces to be just as lovely as their public spaces. We have matching door casings up here and matching baseboard, which again is very unusual. You probably can see it better in this bedroom. Uh, typically speaking, the casings, the surrounds, and the baseboards would have been far less intricate in a space like this. That's not a public space. So let's go ahead and take a look at the two bedrooms that really haven't been altered. Nice in size, but not enormous. Completely functional. This bathroom was added sometime, we think, in the 30s. It's a very, very early bathroom. Built over um, that Italian window bay on the bottom floor, but it, it looks very much in agreement and very sympathetic to the original structure of the house. We have much more simple cast iron mantles in these two bedrooms. This room is slightly larger. And yes, we bought all this furniture and all these goodies, these wonderful treasures with the house. And we have spent days just going through the treasures. And I have so many more days to go through treasures. It's like my favorite thing in the entire world. It's I'm like a kid in a candy store. The floors are cypress. Cypress is a pretty common wood in this area. We're in the delta of Arkansas. So this space, at one point, like many of these old homes, Helen was turned into a boarding house. And this space, you can really see the effects of that. In the 1970s, this area was really remodeled pretty heavily. Um, so we have built-in closets, we have carpet and plywood covering our beautiful original floors. And there has been a very strange vacuum addition put in here with the, with the wasted blank space here that I'm very puzzled by. But the good thing about, and then a little tiny double sink not a kitchenette, don't know. It's it's a puzzlement. But what's great about it is that the shower still functions. So we can come here and we can stay and we can use the shower and it has electricity and it has heat. So unlike, I don't know, any other project we've ever done before, we can actually live in this house while we work on her. And that is <laughs> huge for us. Where did we shower when we were in Florida? Outside on the back porch. <laughs> <laughs> so an inside shower with hot water. Luxury. Step up, total step up. Let's end the tour with our pretty much favorite space in this entire house, right out here. Our second floor portico balcony, from which you can see the entire city of Helena. 
that beautiful Victorian high style George Barber across the street is also a pillow home. We have two amazing Southern Magnolias. They're two different species. You might have to figure out what those are. Probably as old as the home though. The Pillow Thompson House is renowned in the area for its high Victorian design. And the family that built that home also owned this home. And that's the family from whom we purchased this home. And it is the family that since we bought this house, I've discovered I'm related to distantly, but in buying Helen, I have for all intents and purposes bought a family home. So here we are back again after almost two centuries, investing in and restoring a home that I'm connected to. So I hope you enjoyed this little tour of Helen. You've seen a lot of her interesting secrets and sneak peeks. We have more to show you, so stay tuned for more. Bye guys.